Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to White Fountain Anti-Aging Series with Dr. Richard Chang. Well, today is our first lecture. Dr. Chang is among one of the top anti-aging doctors in the US and China. He has been helping patients all around the world to achieve their peak health. So this platform is built to help everyone who is interested to learn more about anti-aging tips for our daily life. So first, we will invite Dennis Bai, the CEO of White Fountain, to give us a short introduction about White Fountain. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Dennis Bai. Uh, welcome, uh, the, everybody, to join uh, today's lecture. Uh, we thank you for spending the time to be with us. And it's great that I can have this opportunity to share with you the messages we are uh, about our work. Uh, I am the interim CEO of Y Fountain. We are a startup company focusing in the biotechnology for the, uh, the discovery, drug discovery uh, for anti aging medicines and uh, treatment. So, uh, our work is uh, to screen um, pool or libraries of uh, chemical compounds as well as the lateral substances and to look for the uh, individual uh, either synthesize the chemicals or lateral plant extract, uh, extract like herbs or some of the uh, alternative medicine components. And we try to identify uh, individual components that uh, could uh, potentially uh, increase the lifespan. We use a, a platform based on the microorganism uh, yeast. So first, uh, we study the chemical compounds and, uh, and the lateral substances. For the, uh, any potential candidates, candidates, compounds or a lateral substance that, that can make the yeast grow, uh, 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 live longer and be able to uh, give birth to more children in their uh, lifespan. Once we could, uh, we plan to screen through about a half, a close to a half million such uh, compounds in about two years time horizon. Once we could identify a uh, layer down to about a few hundreds, and we will move up to the higher uh, organism such as a, a fly or mice to study further. Using disease model, we know that the age uh, can potentially cause many, uh, all kinds of disease, uh, cardios, cancers, uh, immune deficiency, uh, and uh, some of the, the lung uh, deficiency. So uh, depending on the chemical nature of the uh, uh, candidates we have identified, uh, we could potentially categorize them into different uh, classes and uh, uh, tailor to a, a individual disease. If, it, if, it, if, it, if we found that a particular chemical compound has a, a impact to a gene, a genetic uh, gene, which is uh, related to cancer, then we use a cancer model in mice to study further. Likewise, we could use uh, uh, the cardiovascular disease model for, for the study. Um, so uh, for, for, for year three to five, we plan to finish all the animal studies using mice, using uh, fly, and uh, be ready for human clinical trials. Uh, once uh, 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 the human clinical trial should give a strong scientific data back backing uh, for the final application to, uh, um, to human medicine. So that's our business, business plan. As I um, just uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, was in a startup age we just established this year in San Francisco. And uh, our technology, oh, I should mention that we developed a um, uh, innovative uh, technology that's called the high throughput uh, um, drug screening platform using the yeast organism. This technology was developed uh, by professors and his team at the University of California in San Francisco, uh, uh, Dr. Li Hao. Dr. Li Hao is uh, the director of the Anti-Aging Center at the um, University of California in San Francisco. And uh, we also have uh, external members in the pharmaceutical chemistry area uh, who can uh, help us uh, to develop uh, from the yeast discovery all the way to through mice study and uh, to human clinical trial. So we have a uh, we have a team working uh, for the full lifespan of uh, drug development. 
In the same process, because as I just mentioned that they were also going to screen uh, natural substances like herbs, plant extracts, if any components in that category were identified to be effective, increasing lifespan, uh, we would uh, have the opportunity to develop them into dietary uh, supplements because those products have been proved proved to be uh, suitable for human consumption already. So there's uh, there's not it's not necessary to go through the FDA uh, procedure of uh, toxicity study human clinical trials, so basically we can save those steps and uh, um, develop the early stage into dietary supplements. So we are at the starting stage and we look for all helps from, uh, from friends, from institutions, from audience in here. If any of you are interested in our um, work, uh, you are welcome to, uh, uh, to join us in uh, in, in, in a variety of, of ways that I think are suitable for both of us. If you're interested in learning about the dietary products, uh, we can provide you about the progress as well as some of the knowledge we have gained in our works. If you're interested in novel drug discovery, uh, we can share with you about our strategy and also the, strat the progress status uh, of, of our work. And if you are a, uh, for a doctor or healthcare um, group who is developing your own um, treatment for uh, aging related uh, issues, and we can, uh, you, can, you can join us so that we can use our platform to test your products, either be a single uh, herb product or a combination of, uh, of, of chemical substances. We can test your product for the efficacy in our using our model, which is, uh, could uh, provide the uh, additional value of uh, validation to uh, your, uh, the, 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 the effectiveness of uh, your uh, products. So, we, 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 so I believe that we have uh, um, many channels for collaboration. So any of you interested, uh, welcome to, to talk to us. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Back to Jesse. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. That's very exciting. Hopefully we'll see uh, products soon. Thank yes, uh, Dr. Chang, let's give it Thank to you, you Floor. Yeah, I'm already excited, let me tell you this. Actually, I think here we have a perfect combination. I'm going to share with you from the clinical perspective, you know, how as a clinician in the front line, dealing with clients and people, myself as a patient myself, how to live healthier longer. And I'm going to share with you what I see, how we can approach and actually like a, like Diana's Destiny just mentioned, I think it's excellent. Well, thank you again for, uh, you know, Ed uh, and Jesse and Dennis for organizing this because I've been long wanting to do this series because it's not just one lecture that you can, it's a totally different uh, uh, school of thoughts compared to the traditional medicine education that I received over the past 40 some years. Well, that tells you how, how young I am <laughs> and, uh, now here, the title will be, you know, this is an eternal dream. It's a healthier, happier, and longer life. Everybody, you need to be healthier if you want to enjoy your life. And also healthy and happier, because either one is missing is another life. Only on the basis of being healthy and happier, then a longer life means something. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you're staying bad, uh, you know, in pain. It doesn't mean anything, right? So that's what we want. And that's an eternal dream of the mankind. So how we do, how we try to achieve that? Well, this is about me. And so again, shows how long I am, the, the list of this thing. But I, what I want you to say is that I'm trained in essentially originally as internal medicine. And I've gone through a lot of things. Uh, I've done a PhD. I, I graduated from Shanghai Medical University and spent four years in Shanghai in internal medicine. And then before I went on to become, uh, to get a biochemistry, molecular biology, PhD, and then went on to uh, back to medical uh, residency in medicine, laboratory medicine, and the National Cancer Institute for a specialty in cancer. I was also in biotech in Boston back when I was in heydays. And so I've done a lot of things, the general practice, emergency medicine, based bench science, all these things. So uh, now I'm also a board certified anti-aging medicine by the A4L. 
Now, let me start with this slide. This is an article on nature in 2016 that shows you evidence for a limited lifespan by a group from Albert Einstein, Jan Weich. Talking about Jan Weich, that brought, brings me back some memory of my old days again. I visited Jan Weich's laboratory in Reichswijk, Netherlands, uh, TNO, which is like uh, Netherlands uh, NIH, uh, equivalent to, to NIH in the United States. And uh, I had a lot of fun at that time, a lot of windmill. It's a nice place. And then later on, 2018, there's another article also on nature. There's no limit to longevity. Okay, so now what's right? Do we have a limit or do we not? Well, if we can live forever, then how long can we really live? Here is the record that I just mentioned. This is a Jeanne Kelman, a French woman who died in 1997 at the record age of 122. This is confirmed and generally accepted in the scientific community. Nobody, as far as we know, has uh, lived longer than that. Here is a study uh, last year on nature again, showing you the, uh, again, the average as the lower corner here you see is, uh, seems to be one of the numbers that has been around and uh, sort of uh, uh, accepted by many scholars is that probably 120, maybe stretch a little bit, 150. That's kind of the optimal lifespan that one can achieve. Well, they do this by, they arrived at this conclusion through many uh, mechanism or many, many ways. One of the way is by analyzing, for example, uh, analyzing the, you know, we have the top 10 as, oh, no, not this one. Anyway, every disease, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes, all these, they, they have these, stat, I mean, uh, epidemiological studies showing each of these diseases, how many years of human life we were cut, cut short. So if you add back these years to human life, then they can arrive also at about 115, 130 in that neighborhood, okay? So that's the, number can a lot of people accept. If we don't live, if we do not develop chronic diseases, maybe we are able to live to about 120 years of age. Now, this slide shows you the academically sort of uh, uh, generally accepted hallmarks of aging. We know genomic instability, DNA instability, telomere attrition, I think we talked about, you know, shortening of a telomere, and also a bunch of others, including, for example, mitochondrial dysfunction, which is, which is I highlighted here for one reason is that actually we can do something about. It. Okay, and you know again I'm for, I'm coming from the practical clinical side. What can we do today? And of course we also need a dream. We need hope from Dennis's group in the laboratory providing future hope to us, right? And also one other thing is about stem cell stem cell exhaustion, which clinically also we're already using it. We can use it. In, in, in many occasions, okay. So anyway, this is the hallmarks. And one of which we showed the mitochondria. Mitochondria really plays a very central role. People have been focusing a lot on the DNA, which is important, the genomics, the genetics, how we are coded to behave, right? However, mitochondria seem to play a very critical role. We, some of us may know, mitochondria is the battery of our cell is the energy source. But it not only provides energy to, it provides about 90% of the energies our body needs, but also it plays a very critical role, a few critical roles of regulation of cell replication, cell growth, and cell death. You know, like uh, there are a couple of modes of the cell death. Some of them is like, uh, 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 dramatic uh, uh, accident or bad. Some of them are programmed. We know apoptosis program cell death. That's part of the normal health maintenance. Anyway, so mitochondrial dysfunction actually inter is intertwined with nearly every other hallmark. The concept here actually is that these are all critical components of our aging process, not just any one, it's all of them. Now, that's important. I think that this theme will come repetitively 
over and over again. We shouldn't look at things one at a time. Because why do I mention that? Is because today's doctors, myself included, we've been all trained to look at things in a super simplified mode. Okay, we were trained to have like a one set of symptoms. We arrive at a, a this diagnosis, for example, diabetes. Then I give you a diabetes drug. That's the business model, but it doesn't work for chronic diseases, not for acute disease either. I'm going to show you. Now, here is a data from World Bank showing you the average lifespan globally today at 2019 is about 72, 7. 73 years of age. In the United States, it's about 79 years of age, okay? So, like I said, you know, from our optimal life expa- lifespan of 120, we live to globally 72. We only live up to about 60% of our potential. We, that's a lot of improvement, 40%, okay? Even when you expand, you know, so that's the first order of business. How can we gain back the lost 40%. Now here is a study by, uh, from Medicare back in 2014. They surveyed 1.3 plus million Medicare recipients. All these people were age 67, okay? The figure on the left shows you the correlation between number of chronic diseases and expected life expectancy. Basically, if you were at 67 in the United States and you have zero chronically, I mean, zero uh, clinically diagnosable disease, then your expected life expectancy is another 23, 22 years. You can expect to live about 90 years of age. That is if you have zero. If you have five, I summarize here on the little table here, if you have five chronic conditions, you can expect to live about to 82. It's a short, it's about eight years short, 9%. If you have 10 or more chronic diseases, man, your life is a lot shorter at 72, okay? So this, what a message here is that clearly these chronic diseases are the first roadblock to longevity, okay? This is a table of the top 10 chronic diseases. The top one is heart disease, site number two is cancer. That cuts short, that kills a lot of people, okay? So clearly the first thing, the first business order is the chronic diseases. And 80% of older people that basically 65 and older have one or more chronic conditions. And two thirds, more than two thirds, six, eight percent have two or more. So that is the predominant disease. The, this is the first thing we need to do. Here is my general summary of my understanding of aging and anti-aging medicine. So I kind of class, I mean, I kind of divide anti-aging into sort of two categories. The number one, I call it task number one, or the general sense of anti-aging, or the clinical side, things that we can do today, is the prevention and reversal of chronic diseases. Making sense, right? Because these are the diseases that are cutting short of our lifespan. If we don't suffer from these diseases, we may be able to, at least the data show that we can live up to 90%. That's the average. Some people live longer, right? And maybe even longer than that. So that's the first order of business. And that's the routine, mundane, the things we do today, we can do today. Now, the specific anti-aging, in my understanding, a lot of the scientific community, that's what they do is, what I mean by specific is by how we can extend lifespan beyond the biological limit, which is programmed in the DNA, in the telomere, in these other things. So that's what I call, because basically the way to interpret is that, including, for example, DNA instability, uh, telomere attrition, some of it, a lo- most of it probably are genetically programmed, meaning even if you live a perfectly healthy life, those things will still happen because it's programmed. However, today we live in an environment with a lot of the toxins I just mentioned about, a lot of unhealthy lifestyle, and also a lot of stress that is just mentioned. You know, the last three years, the, the, the politics, the pandemic, and the, the other things that really takes a toll on our lifespan. 
So those are the issues. Those are not the in, in both, but those are not the biological limits. The true specific anti-aging is if we can extend those lifespan. And that's more to me on the basic science part. And uh, you know how we can tweak our genome, the DNA genetics to extend beyond. So I think uh, we need both of these. Okay, and of course we are not separating these, you know, uh, totally clearly. And what I'm saying is that when we are doing this test number one, if we come up with nice nutraceutical molecules that can help tweak our genetic system, we can use that too. So we can combine both. But we need to understand that this, at least this is how I understand aging. So uh, here I want to show you this cartoon. So we can use these nutraceuticals to extend our lifespan to infinity and beyond. Now, like I mentioned earlier before we started, the first thing people jump onto is this is the question I should I got today uh, yesterday when I posted a flyer, and today we got another one is that they skip the prevention treatment of chronic diseases. That's boring. They jump directly to the anti-aging drugs or Marcus, what do you have to offer me? <laughs> okay, this is what I, you know, we know is a quick fix mentality. Okay, of course, when there's a need, there's a market. So the market today is full of these miracle anti-aging peers. Don't worry, if you want to make a, a few quick bucks, that's the way to go. But to me, like again, you know, I'm not against money. I want money, I like money, I love money. Don't get me wrong. However, my first order of business interesting is I want to see what really works, how I can keep myself healthier and happier. At the same time, make some money, okay? So that we, we need to get to the priority straight. What really works is first, and then see if we can, you know, of course you want to provide a service, sell a decent product, people will pay money, okay? So I'm gonna share with you in this lecture and hopefully in the future lectures, how I, you know, over the past about, more than 10 years, close to 20 years, particularly in the anti-aging field and over all 40 some years in medicine. How, what I have learned, I'll share with you. I'm also from the consumer side of myself. This is what I have been formulating over the past 20 years, uh, probably 15, since I uh, started attending the A4M conference, the Anti-Aging uh, Institute. Basically on the top right, the orange in the center here, is the clinical diseases, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular diseases. And today, like I mentioned here in the text, current medical model is that focusing on a single, singular druggable targets. Okay, for example, coronary heart disease, they focus on cholesterol, then give you billion dollar market value of cholesterol drugs. Do they work? I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about in this one, but they don't work, I'm telling you. Not only they don't work, they also cut short your lifespan. Diabetes, they focus on sugar, okay? Cancer, they fo focus on mutations. Well, let me talk about mutation a little bit. Everybody knows about cancer, right? Because uh, we all know, we agree, this, there's not much debate right here, is that the 90% or more of the cancers are caused by carcinogens. There's no debate here. And the carcinogens cause DNA mutations. So they develop drugs against mutation, okay, huh? makes sense, okay, that's reasonable. But have you ever heard any <clears throat> doctors in the clinic talk about what carcinogens may you may have other than cigarettes, maybe? No. So this is the current business model. Um, you know, what I'm saying is as a patient, as a, as a consumer, we need to know these things. I'm not here to spread a conspiracy theory. We just need to know their playbook. So we know what they're trying to do, what their weakness is. Okay, so to me, we all know this is common sense is that these are clinical manifestations. We need to go to the root cause. Everybody knows how to talk. So the, the green two green boxes are the root causes. One is the environmental, basically things that you have little control of. You know, you can't control the uh, environment. However, you can control your own lifespan, your attitude, your exercise, nutrition, these things, right? So basically these root causes will affect on your body, the number three in the bottom. So going through a series of changes that in your body eventually leading to clinical symptoms. And here you can call them mechanisms or 
the processes. For example, we're talking about mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondrial dysfunction is partially a genetically programmed condition probably, but also a lot of these today's uh, uh, diet toxins can, inf uh, can affect your mitochondrial dysfunction. We talked about genetic mutations. Of course, carcinogens cause mutations, which is part of the process that eventually may contribute to cancer development. But today's medicine, we usually don't address too much of this. Definitely, we don't address these root causes. So if we understand how these things, then we may be able to uh, target the root causes directly. Now, talking about the disease, we mentioned that the business model today is singular, right? Actually, I cannot, let me put this way conservatively. Most of the diseases are multifactorial, particularly the chronic diseases. It's not caused by one single factor. Heart disease is not caused by just cholesterol. Cholesterol is not a root cause. It is a process. We're not going to talk too much about today. But I want to use COVID-19 because everybody knows about COVID-19 today. A lot of people probably know more than I do. So COVID-19 is an acute disease. And we also have heard mostly from the authorities, government agencies, even international agencies, focusing on the virus. But is COVID-19 the cause, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, is that a single cause disease? No, it is not. Let me explain to you why. This is straightforward. There's no controversy here. There shouldn't be, at least. First of all, when you catch SARS-CoV-2, most people are asymptomatic or only with mild symptoms. Very few people develop a severe COVID disease or even die, right? So at any particular time and in any particular community, usually it's one of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Of course, it has gone through a couple of mutations. So the question here is that it's the same virus, but why there's a diverse clinical presentations from asymptomatic to death. So clearly, virus is not the only factor determining this disease. So basically, it's a tug of war as shown, uh, represented by this, uh, this cartoon. It's not a single factor disease. What determines the clinical outcome is more of your immunity rather than the virus itself. Okay, so this is basically your immunity or these vitamins, antioxidants versus the virus itself. So this is clear, there's no point. I'm willing to debate with anybody. Yeah, I usually, let's say Fauci, I'm willing to debate against him. Over the past two and a half years, as Jesse may know, I've been talking at various media, TV stage. Anyway, so what I want to show you here is <clears throat> even a acute disease like COVID-19, it is not a single factorial disease. That's the message I want you to remember, particularly coronary diseases. So here is my summary of my approach over the past, uh, combining my 40 some years, particularly last 10, uh, my understanding. Basically, here is my approach to health and uh, diseases and anti-aging. And on the left, these two figures, cartoons showing you, basically, I think we should all take an integrated view or holistic view. You know, basically you have to analyze these factors, at least the major factors and in the natural view, because I'm gonna explain that a bit later and balance the view. Don't treat only one side of the thing. You have to look at the whole body. Doctors, you should look at the patient. Don't look at any particular organ or any particular test. You treat the whole patient. So that's what I call the holistic and the balanced. Or natural, what, what is natural? Here on the lower level here, the figure. So I look at the health as three levels, three different levels. Now, why do I do this is because hopefully that will help us to analyze the complex health and diseases in a little bit more straightforward way. So I look at health as three different levels. The first is anatomy. We all know to be healthy, you got to have a head, two extremities, I mean, four extremities, up and lower, you have to have a liver, all these things, that's obvious. The second is that these organs and cells and tissues, they have to work together in a, uh, in a coordinated fashion, right? We all know Stephen Hawking, the British uh, 
a physicist who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. He had all the anatomic parts as we as far as we know, but he he couldn't move his body. So basically, he had a neurological issue. His nerves were not able to coordinate the movements of his body parts. Right. So that's what I call why. What what's important? What do I mean by here? Physiolo physiology. I'm talking about the neuro health and endocrine hormonal health. This is critical, particularly hormonal. This is a, a major part in anti-aging medicine, hormone balance, okay? What do these things do? Hormones interact, coordinate the teamwork between the cells and organs, okay? At the very basic level, the cellular level or the biochemistry level, what I call, is that you need to have the optimal nutrition and the absence or the minimal presence of toxins. That's again, common sense. There's no debate here. Is that what is nutrition? All the normal parts that normally we need, we got to have them. Not only that, but also they got to be present in optimal amounts and also probably normal and optimal ratio. What are those optimal? We need to research, but that's the concept. We got to have all the good things in the right amount. At the same time, we shouldn't have or we should have the minimum amount of toxins, the things that normally shouldn't be there. For example, heavy metal, lead, mercury, those things have no business in our body, but today they're everywhere. Yes, many of you probably have them. So that's what I call at the biochemistry level. So if we dissect the medicine anti-aging in this way, things are a lot easier to understand. And here is the text that limits I mean, that describes or, or briefly is that, you know, some of it uh, like spiritual, natural sleep and the love, natural, getting and, and exercise, right? Diet, nutrition, toxin, hormone balance, regenerative medicine. That's the list I go through. Okay, practically all the uh, therapeutic uh, drugs or agents or measures will more or less fall into one of these categories. But again, out of this list, let me tell you, Many of them are highly controversial. My job here is not to, uh, to uh, my job here, let me put it this way, is try to understand what these things are and, uh, and to try to understand both sides, the, the, both sides of the coin and uh, uh, arrive at our own conclusion. I will present data and you can arrive at your own conclusion. Of course, I will give you my opinion. For example, let me give you one opinion about uh, the diet. We, of course, very controversial. We all have read about Mediterranean diet, which is good, right? Yes, we agree. Now, Mediterranean diet compared to the standard American diet, it's better. A lot of research paper that show that. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't really know how to read science papers. We got to be careful because science papers will show you, for example, they will show you Mediterranean diet helps improve cardiovascular disease or, or diabetes or whatever. But you have to understand what they're comparing to. If you're comparing, most of these diets are comparing to the so-called SADA diet, the basically what I call junk diet, American's junk diet. Of course, Mediterranean diet is better. The question, the real question is, for example, some of you may know it's getting more and more popular, the low carb or ketogenic diet. Now, What's better, Mediterranean versus low carb or keto? Okay, that's another question, right? So in scientific papers, we haven't seen many of those comparisons, but that's something we need to understand. By the same token, you will see in science paper, for example, NMA. We know NMA right now is marketed as kind of like a miracle anti-aging pill, right? It's kind of pricey as well. What is NMN? NMN is a precursor to a important molecule called NAD+, which is involved in more than 50% of our biochemical re reactions in our body. Yes, it's involving everything. Cell growth, your muscle growth, your energy metabolism, a lot of things, okay? Now, there are a couple of precursors. NMN is a new one and it's a more expensive one. Also, another one we everybody knows probably is vitamin B3 or niacin. Okay. This thing has been around, or at least the studies have been around for at least more than 70 years. Okay. So you when you see a paper that talks good things about NMN, the question, my question is, 
comparing to niacin. Is it a better or is it the same? Because there's a huge price difference. Niacin is a lot cheaper. So that's kind of thing that I'm going to analyze it because on the side, why? Because yet, generally speaking, more expensive products tend to get more study they because there's more commercial interest in it, right? So we have to understand. Well, of course, these papers don't really analyze that too. They don't tell you now some probably does the same thing. Actually, yes. Today I got a paper, I mean, somebody sent me a paper about niacin uh, improves the, or, or increases the natural killer cells anti-tumor activity. Actually, back years ago, they have already shown niacin does the same. Why? It's the same mechanism, okay? So those are kind of things I'm here to do because I need to know and I will share with you, okay? So about nutrition, a couple of things here is that nutrition is critical for cell regulation, replication, apoptosis, autophagy, those things, energy, mitochondria, like I mentioned. One of the very important concepts you will hear me talk more and more is oxidative stress. Uh, and today I'm gonna to talk a little bit more well, I wanna cover the general thing, okay? And hopefully in the future, we'll talk about practical things. Toxin, toxin is very widespread, okay? Toxins are natural existing toxic materials and toxicants are the man-made or synthetic toxins, okay? So environmental and also your own, in your body, like chronic infections, metabolic. So that's another major category. Hormonal balance I just mentioned about, including thyroid hormone, adrenal hormone, sex hormone, growth hormone. Growth hormone, there's a lot of study on anti-aging, okay? So that's another, so here, and the regenerative medicine stem cells include, for example. So the point here is that only if you take a holistic approach to include as many of these measures as possible, then you can optimize your anti-aging protocol, okay? You skip all these things, jump onto the growth hormone, for example, and a lot of Chinese here, I said, you know, I always use this Chinese joke is that, you smoke and drink play mahjong overnight and you expect to pop a pill, you can live healthy and forever. I'm sorry, you'll be disappointed. It doesn't work that way, okay? So we got to combine both. So this is the list I usually go by. And not only uh, in anti-aging, but also when I approach chronic disease, that's the same thing how I approach. Here is a summary in a graph. In a graph. Um, so here you have three curves. The black curve is the average lifespan today, okay? Above age 30 or 40, actually we have a lot of diseases like I showed you, okay? So average lifespan today is about 80 years of age. If you are careful, you pay attention to your diet, your lifestyle, you exercise, all these things, you probably can live to 90, 100 years, okay? And we hope that by anti-aging medicine, and I put in the text right here, also molecular medicine, a nutrition, optimal hormonal balance, and these other things, maybe we can extend our lifespan further by uh, above 10, 110, 115, 120-ish, okay? So that's very realistic for a lot of people at our age today. And whether we can extend beyond that, well, hopefully Dennis will bring us more uh, hope and in the future. So uh, this is, uh, here is, uh, I will, for the remaining time, I will go through quickly, I, you know, I don't want to take too much time, is I will show you with this approach that we have been able to improve and reversal many of the incurable or hard to treat diseases, okay? For example, coronary artery heart disease. Yes, we are able to reverse, yes, I use a reverse, or you can say cure actually, uh, cardiovascular disease. We have seen two cases at least. And also in the literature, there are you know, quite a few other cases. We are able to improve and reverse metabolic diseases, including type two diabetes. Weight loss is easy. Okay, we have done a lot. Bone health, including osteoporosis. We have done a lot of all human disease. I think I will have quite a few pictures that I will show you here, okay? Cancer, yes. Emotional disorder we're talking about, uh, that is what we talk about. Well, I just go quickly here. I'm not gonna go through the detail. This is one uh, uh, coronary artery heart disease. Basically the patient has coronary heart disease with pain. He, he was symptomatic, okay? And he had to take a nitroglycerin to control the pain. And uh, you, uh, this is Chinese, this is from Chengdu in China. Anyway, he, uh, this was uh, two, two years ago. 
he had a CT angio angiography, basically, you know, angiogram. This is a standard uh, uh, testing test for uh, to confirm diagnosis of heart disease today. He was confirmed to have a coronary artery disease with, with mild stenosis in the proximal end of the LAD, a major coronary artery, and there was a moderate stenosis in the middle portion. 50 to 69, that's the classification, okay? So he came to our service, I went through, uh, this is our auto, also molecular medicine protocol. Basically, the, I already mentioned about the diet and nutrition and these things. Uh, we're not gonna go to the detail, hopefully in the future we'll do. Eight months later, he had a repeat in the same place and improved, okay? The mild stenosis disappeared. And the moderate stenosis reduced to mild. It's improvement, this eight months, okay? 20 months from the start. So which is uh, by about February this year, yeah, a couple of months ago. And all those stenosis are gone, reversed, okay? And also here, yeah, this is it, yeah. He also sent me a message showing you, showing me that he used to have these symptoms, the chest pain, and now he, I think he said that he can fly, I mean, he can uh, climb the stairs like 11 staircases without any stopping or any issues. So basically, clinically, he also, uh, re uh, I mean, became symptom free, okay. And that's the first one. And that's another one, similar age. This is from Changsha, Hunan, 61 years old. He had, uh, again, CT and uh, uh, ultrasound confirmed that carotid artery stenosis, okay? And uh, make a long story short, he went through the same thing, I think six months later, I think it was six months later, yes. And uh, the no more abnormality, basically no more plaque formation, no more stenosis of the carotid artery, okay? So these are the two cases of, uh, we have some other cases reported, but I didn't uh, show a picture here, uh, you know, re reversal of uh, atherosclerosis. Yes, these in current uh, medicine, that's not possible. Okay, I mean, if you try to lower cholesterol, it won't happen. We have done a lot of cases in, in autoimmune diseases. This is my first case of actually autoimmune disease quite a few years ago of a psoriasis here in the United States. This is a patient came in for a weight of 300 pounds when he came in, I think 299. Anyway, at the same time he had as on the left side, you can see the psoriasis a skin rash in Chinese is new pishua. He had a, four extremities covered with these rashes, okay? And so anyway, weight loss is easy, you know, uh, but the, you know, what's in, what really caught my attention is about one month later, two to four weeks later in the center, his skin rash improves significantly, okay? And this on the right, uh, the picture is not that clear, but you can see briefly it's all normal now. This is 11, 11 months later, he lost a hundred pounds, he went down to 200 pounds and he, his skin rash were all gone. This is my first time that I start clicking. Oh yes, actually I know it, but I'm not a dermatologist. I'm not a skin doctor. Actually, a lot of skin diseases have start from your gut, from your, from your stomach, okay, from your intestines. And since then I've seen quite a few. This is also a one, I think this is my first Chinese patient back in China many years ago as showing you you know, all these skin rash on the top panel. And he was so happy later on, you know, very nice skin here. And this is vitiligo, Dai Dian Feng in Chinese. You can see in one year. This actually is a long time friend of mine. And anyway, you see, you can see the dramatic improvement of the vitiligo, okay? And this is a, one of my American patients, Caucasian here in the United States. And well, he basically, this is an interesting lady. She, uh, she drove by my clinic on a regular basis because of her work. And uh, anyway, she had a his six months history of skin rash and uh, low grade abdominal pain. And she was to the degree she couldn't function. She went to the dermatologist and GI doctor, did a CT skin biopsy, but uh, it, they couldn't figure out what it is. And one time, you know, they saw my sign and the integrative, integrative health center. And I said, well, what the heck, let's just start back to see what they do. One that she came in, actually, I already knew what it was, but I still listened to her. After 10 minutes, I told her, I said, I think I know what it is. So basically, so you can see the rash, how bad it is. 
Why, what is this? Is basically she's having the reaction to the poisons or toxins in her diet, which is a very repetitively very common thing. Skin diseases, autoimmune diseases are on the rise. Why? A major issue is of the environmental toxins that cause our gut to be leaky and to allow a lot of these big molecules, some undigested or even poisons, even bugs, going to our system to cause immune reactions. That's a major reason of a lot of these autoimmune diseases, okay? So basically for this patient, I told her go on the, the I have a strict, very strict diet for this, basically rid of all these plant-based uh, foods. Anyway, uh, this was two weeks later, I was already in Shenzhen, I went to Shenzhen for a conference to give a lecture. And she was improving. As you can still see the redness, but much improved. This was two months later. I was still in China, completely uh, in, improved. When I came back in September that year, and three months later, her skin was totally normal, and she was very happy. Okay. So this type of, this is a alopecia, you know, loss of hair, and you see the difference between. And this is a, a lady in 78, I think. Anyway, she had a two, 20 years history of showgreens. It's another type of autoimmune disease with skin rash, you can see clearly. And I put her on the diet again. And within this was within yeah, one year, one month. You can see the significant improvement of the redness and the skin inflammation. Actually, I've seen this repetitively. Actually, the more acute the symptoms are, the easier, the more significant improvement will be. Invariably, I can help them to improve within a month, a couple of weeks usually, okay? I love this type of skin rash, why? Because one picture is worth a thousand words. I don't have to explain a lot, show you a picture, it works. Because these, most of these patients, they have seen a lot of doctors, they couldn't help, okay? Here's ulcerative colitis, you know. Uh, actually, the Japanese prime minister, uh, Abe-san, uh, he had this ulcerative colitis. It's another type of autoimmune disease and this patient improved. He, she used to have like bleeding and all these problems and didn't go on steroids, which is standard therapy. When on our, our, our you know, uh, functional medicine, she, her symptoms significantly improved. And this is my own bone health. You know, at my age, you can see, um, actually this was three years ago, I'm older than that now. So my bone density, is better if you extrapolate here. That these are the 20, 30 years of age. I'm better than the majority of people of any age 20 or 30, okay? Because when I exercise, I eat healthy, and I take a lot of uh, vitamin supplements. I will talk hopefully in the future more, you know, about these things. And even today, you know, uh, on the badminton court, I oftentimes, you know, jump dive to save, you know, people. Of, oh, are you okay? I said, don't worry, my bones are stronger than yours probably, okay? Weight loss is simple. This was, you know, I haven't updated, but this is many years ago, like since then is very familiar. Anyway, this lady lost more than about 60% of her body weight. In the English uh, system, we use this charting system. Patient can enter their weight and a computer will draw a line. This weight loss is easy. And this is a, one of my first Chinese. This is a CEO of a public company. And he wanted my help because he wanted to look, one, the punk, this is when the primary went public and he looked much better. This, I forgot how, I think four months, you know. All right, this is a quick overview. Basically, well, thanks again for the organizing of this series of lectures for to Ed, Dennis, Jessica, and also Cynthia. And uh, so today, you know, what I wanna show you is that a lot of these anti-aging, uh, yeah, of course, we have to take a holistic view starting from yourself. Okay, I like I always say, if you start living a healthier life and exercising, eating right, and uh, just doing those things, I think more than half of the health problem will be gone. You will improve it. You, you will appreciate it, okay? And hopefully in the future, uh, we will go uh, one at a time about diet, particularly the controversial ones. You know, things like exercise that pretty straightforward, probably we don't have to spend a lot of time, but diet, nutrition, toxin, those things, hormones, we need a little bit more. And hopefully we'll also invite some other experts to share with us and uh, as a, on an ongoing basis. Anyway, I'll stop here and to answer any questions that you may have. Helen, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, Dr. Chen, uh, would you briefly uh, give your opinion about uh, lipoic acid as antioxidant? And Which one? I'm sorry. 
lipoic acid. Uh, lipoic acid, okay. Yeah, uh, you are talking about alpha lipoic acid. Yes, alpha. Excellent question. This is a very important question. Alpha lipoic acid, actually, you know, it, it is. It oftentimes is considered as an antioxidant. Well, first of all, what is an antioxidant? I mentioned in my talk about oxidative stress. And let me repeat this thing is that what is an oxidative stress? Oxidative stress is a measure, basically it's a balance. I saw that I had that slide, maybe I, I didn't see that. Basically it's the balance between free radicals and antioxidants. Basically it's toxins and nutrition. We can think this way, good thing and bad things. Balance is critical. Now, today, because we have way too many toxins in our body, all the toxins in the chemical at the chemical level, they are oxidants. They they grab electrons from our from our important molecules like DNA, protein, and lipids, and basically causing our products uh, molecules to be oxidized and therefore destroyed uh, or, or harmed. Okay. Now, the and these antioxidants in our body usually they do not work in a solo fashion. They work in a cascade, okay? And uh, for example, alpha-lipoic acid. Alpha-lipoic acid is one part of the very basic uh, non-enzymatic cascades of antioxidation. Basically, a free radical will probably pass on to, let's say, vitamin C or vitamin E, and then from there, we'll pass on to like uh, CoQ10, alpha lipoic acid, and ultimately on, on to glutathione. As many of you probably know about glutathione. So basically it's the electron or the, the, the free radical that needs to be passed in a teamwork, eventually to be hydrolyzed, to basically become water and CO2, okay? or oxygen actually. So that's how free radicals and antioxidants work in our body. Practically there are, there are no antioxidants that work solo. Okay, a few important things here. And we'll talk about this in the future where we need to have at least one lecture. Basically in our body, we have water soluble and lipid soluble, for example, right? We know our blood is mostly water. So all the biochemical reactions, or most at least, happen in the water environment, okay? And we know our cells, our cell membrane, like a skin, like a gut, mostly are made of lipids. And so, for example, we know our cell membrane, at least half of them are like cholesterol, lipids. So, um, you know, uh, these anti uh, the, the toxins, they will attack our cell membrane. Basically, that's a lipid soluble. So on our cell mem membrane, we require vitamin E. We all know vitamin E is a lipid soluble antioxidant. So the very first step in preventing our lipid to be oxidized, we need vitamin E. There's research to show without vitamin E, vitamin C doesn't work. What happens here is that vitamin E is the first molecule that receives the free radical. Then vitamin E passes down onto vitamin C. So you need vitamin C as well. And then onto lipoic acid, like I mentioned, CoQ10, glutathione, to make it simple. Okay. Also, we have the need of magnesium, selenium, these other things. The point I'm making to answer your question is, is that it's a teamwork, it's a, like a cogwheel. And I did, I have a lecture on this and uh, as, you know, it, uh, that was also in English. Oh, there's a Chinese version as well. And it, uh, in more detail, uh, ask me later, I will send you the link on that one. So the point I'm making here is that, again, even in nutrition field, a lot of people focus on, in, even in my own, uh, I'm probably telling you, uh, I'm also the newest, uh, uh, I was this year's award recipient of the International also Molecular Medicine Hall of Fame. Even in the among these, uh, you know, nutrition experts, a lot of people over focus on one particular over the other. 
I'm against that concept. You know, these are all important, but uh, like a teamwork, you know, uh, uh, the last two two weeks ago, my office manager went on vacation. I was uh, by myself in the office. I was so busy because I was doing answering phone, this, all that. So there's nobody who is more important than the other. It, it, it requires a teamwork. Antioxidants work the same, okay? And uh, that's one thing. So another thing is that today, a lot of us, most of us, yes, most of us have some form of, of uh, vitamin and nutrition deficiency. We know vitamin D3, okay? Practically, depending on the standard of normal reference you use, if you don't supplement, if you don't spend a lot of time in the sunshine, you are deficient, period, okay? So including lipoic acid, including vitamin C, vitamin E. So to answer your question, yes, uh, that's how I follow the is. Oh, thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Helen, for the question. So there is another, uh, from the audience, this um, they want you to give advice on weight loss. Yes, that's a good question. And uh, we will talk a little bit more later, uh, uh, hopefully. So basically, uh, I mentioned in uh, one of our slides is that we need to look at the weight gain or obesity is a clinical manifestation. And uh, the root causes starting from diet. It's your unhealthy lifestyle. Well, make long story short, I'm not going to go detail. Just tell you this. If you want to lose weight, go to intermittent fasting and the low carb diet. If better, if you can do ketogenic, that's even better. Uh, let me just uh, add a few more sentences here. Think about our body. Uh, many of you may have heard of ketogenic diet. What is ketogenic diet? In common sense, we can call ketogenic diet fat burning diet, okay? So ketogenic in English, keto means ketone, genic means producing. So ketogenic diet, it means that a diet that makes you to produce ketone bodies. What are ketone bodies? Ketone bodies are the shortest, the smallest lipids, lipid molecules. Okay, so when your body, you can detect, you can test for ketones in your urine, in your blood or in your breast. Okay, so when you can detect ketone bodies in your body, you know your body is burning fat. Normally when you eat sugar, in, on average, probably if you eat more than 50 grams of sugar, you are not gonna produce, uh, you're not gonna uh, burn fat as energy. Our body uses sugar first as energy. Okay, only when you run out of sugar, then you will start burning fat. Now, actually, that's a good question. Usually this is a, at least a 90 minutes lecture, but let me give you a short version of it. Think about it, Diabe type two diabetic patients. The typical type two diabetic patients are overweight or obese. And when they miss a meal, they may feel low sugar, feeling weak and tired, sleepy, right? This, most people know this. Why is that? Because they miss a meal, they are hungry. Their body doesn't have energy. But isn't that odd? These people, like I mentioned, they are usually overweight, meaning they have a lot of energy in their body. They have a lot of energy in their body, but when they need it, they are not able to metabolize, burn the fat to provide energy. Why is that? I use a Chinese analogy like a peng zi qing fan wan tang fan. It's like a beggar with a golden bow. You have a lot of money, you don't know how to use it. Why is that? It is because people who develop diabetes usually have spent years, at least 10, 15 years, okay? Uh, uh, we'll have an, anyway, pre-diabetes starts at least 10 years before clinical diagnosis. So over the many years, these diabetic patients tend to eat a lot of sugar. Basically their body is burning sugar for energy, like most of us actually, if you haven't been doing this low carb diet. So your body relies on sugar to burn fat. I mean, burn, to produce energy. So your body does not burn fat regularly to produce energy because you don't, your body doesn't need to. Also today, we have food everywhere, right? When I was in Shanghai Medical University, I, I was year of 77, you know, we had a three square meals, 
but we didn't have a fridge in the in the dorm. We didn't have money to buy snacks. So three meals, that's it. But today, food is everywhere, 24, 24 seven. So people are eating more and they eat a lot of carbs, you know, sugars. So your body over the years begin gradually lose the ability to burn fat. You have to understand burning fat, it takes a different system. You need a different kind of receptors, hormones, all these things, okay? So if you don't use it, you lose it. So type two diabetic patients, they have not been able to burn the fat for many years. All of a sudden you don't eat sugar, their body is not able to burn fat to produce energy. Whereas me, you know, I play badminton again in the court, uh, most of the Indians, I have another Chinese friend who's 10 years younger, who I don't think he's here today, so I can talk a little bit. He has a big belly. And he oftentimes when they play, he says he feels low, low sugar. I keep on telling him he doesn't listen. I say, you need to eat more fat because that's what I do. Every day, lunchtime, I, you know, Dennis, I mean, uh, uh, Jesse Bruno, I have a bulletproof tea. Basically, I put 60 grams of butter, grass fed. I can afford that a little bit, and, and put in the tea, and I drink that. So before I go to, oftentimes also you, you add a BHB, which is a like a ketone product into it. What, why do I do that? Is because I'm forcing my body to get used to burning fat to provide energy. So when I'm on badminton or do any anything, anything else. A couple of years ago, I went to, I took my daughter to Great War with, you know, a tour group. These were young, 20 years, some, you know. Very few of them were able to climb to the top of the Bad Darling, the Great War. I was dumb, 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 all the way up, you know. Why? Because I'm used to this. So my body is able to produce energy. So coming back to weight loss, most, you know, when you are used to ketogenic diet, your body, because no matter how skinny you are, you have plenty of fat. Okay, so your body is able to burn fat to release energy. You will not develop these extreme hunger, extreme weakness kind of feeling. So I advise you, anybody, everybody, yes, 100% period, to at least try to get your body used to ketogenic diet. You don't have to unketogenic every day, but it's like in Kung Fu, you know? In Kung Fu, you know, in Chinese, they say you have to you have to sort of break through those those roadblocks in Kung Fu, so you get very, you know. So in like ketogenic, the same thing is that you need to train your body to get used to basically to have all the hormones receptors in a normal condition. So when your body needs energy, you can burn it. You need to get used to it. This takes up on average between two weeks to two months, okay? Everybody's different, a little bit different. Once you get used to it, we will have at least one lecture specifically to talk about, talk about this, how to do it, is that your body will be able to burn, basically your body needs to be like a hybrid car. You need to be able to burn both on sugar and fat, period, okay? So, and once you are keto adapted, so to speak, then, you can, you can enjoy carbs. I do a little bit too, I just don't, don't overdo it, okay? So once you do that, so basically ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting, just these two, of course, adding exercise if you can, you'll be able to lose weight. Of course, we have other things you can add on, but just doing these two, you will have a very highly likely chance to, to succeed. Thank you, Dr. Chang. I, I think that's a really good answer. I think next, in our next lecture, we can talk that in okay, detail. Let's, okay, let's, so let's next, talk about that. So the next question from the audience is, is high blood pressure reversible? And if so, oh. how? Oh, that I just, this is one of the easiest thing I, I can do. Well, let me, first of all, let's start with the example. My parents, luckily, I mean, you know, they are, 80, they are 85 and 87. I'm, I'm glad I'm gonna see them in a month, less than a month. And uh, my parents, particularly my mother, they used to, both of them used to have very high blood pressure. Uh, my parents, their high level, you know, the, sister, the, the, the top one used to be at least 160, 180, oftentimes 200. And the lower level was like, uh, usually was 95, 100, 110. And uh, this is quite a few years back. And I was, you know, I'm an internist. You know? <laughs> I couldn't... Uh, keep their blood sugar, I mean, blood pressure stable. And I was using at least like three or four blood pressure pills. And actually that's quite often among my other patients at the time. So gradually I learned 
of these things. You know, Jesse, Jesse and I, we met was 10 years ago, or at least seven, eight years ago in Beijing and in, in Beijing okay. conference, okay? Anyway, so yeah, interesting, you know, I told you about, I was very interested by the conjurer. And why is that? Because I, I started playing badminton about 12, 13 years ago, very similar time I started. For, so I want to have energy because I, one thing I couldn't beat against these young guys because I get tired. And you know, in sports, in badminton, if you are not able to run to the right spot, no matter, it doesn't matter how good a skill you are, you are not able to hit it back, right? Because that's important. So every conference I go, first thing I ask, how can I improve my energy? You know, one of the common things I hear is my magnesium. Many experts tell magnesium, because you know, between conferences, they don't have a lot of time to talk. So coming back to this, high blood pressure, there are at least the two mechanisms or two basic mechanisms to high blood pressure. One is the blood vessel hardening. It's a, like a solid, okay? You have calcium deposits into blood vessel walls, and these are like hard, you know, they don't, they don't, you know, our normal blood vessels are supposed to be like a balloon, they are elastic, okay? They're supposed to be. But uh, when you get older, you have a lot of uh, calcium deposits uh, along, among other things, they are not that elastic anymore. That's one thing. But on top of that, also, you know, that our blood vessel walls have these muscles outside of these blood vessel walls because so that our body is able to regulate the blood pressure. Okay, so this is kind of soft, is, is flexible. Now, one of the common things today is that a lot of people, we have too much calcium in our body. Jesse may have known that I'm against calcium supplements. Why is, well, well, that's another lecture. We have a book on this, okay? At least one hour lecture. So anyway, how do we treat blood pressure? Of course, start from diet. A lot of the bad thing coming from diet, okay? So what I said, a low carb ketogenic diet and the intermittent fasting applies to, yes, let me repeat, 100% everybody. And I want to spend at least one hour lecture to show you, I think early on, before we started, I talked with Dennis. That's how we used to live. Do, I always say we humans have to put on a nice suit living in the high rises, leather shoes. We forget fundamentally we are animals. Do not forget we are animals. Have What animal have you seen in the wilderness that eats three meals a day? No. We are supposed to have intermittent fasting, meaning we're not supposed to eat regularly. We're supposed to, when we eat, we eat a lot, and then we go on a period of time we don't eat. So that the energy in our body flows bi-directionally. When we eat, we're able to store the excess energy. When we don't eat, we're supposed to release the energy. Why type two diabetic patients develop the hypoglycemia? Because they do not, their body does not know how to release energy anymore. They eat too much, too often. Okay, coming back to this, calcium. So what do we do? Well, first of all, stick to the diet. Number two, lots of magnesium. Okay. And actually, uh, a, a we, we are publishing a paper. Uh, I, you, uh, this is about calcium too. Is that recently there's a paper coming out of New England Journal of Medicine. I think it was last week or maybe 10 days, within the last this month, showing that vitamin D supplementation doesn't improve osteoporosis. Again, this is a typical modern medicine mentality. They are looking at one thing. The article I wrote along with Thomas Levy, many of you probably know he's a well-known uh, vitamin C expert, and he published a book, which I translated into Chinese, we published in English this uh, article, which will come out next year, uh, next week. I listed all the literature, studies, clinical scientific studies showing you vitamin C, vitamin E, magnesium, uh, vitamin K2, hormones, their effects on improving osteoporosis. And they only talk about vitamin D, okay? So coming back to high blood pressure, same concept here is that, is that uh, by, first of all, restricting calcium so that you don't have excess calcium to deposit in the blood vessel walls, okay? And magnesium will relax. Magnesium is natural antagonist. 
basically uh, opposite to calcium that relaxes the muscles. Let me tell you about magnesium. When you have headaches, high blood pressure, heart irregular, excuse me, heartbeats, or you have insomnia, you are unable to sleep, or anxiety, mass, magnesium helps. One of the common things today among us is that we, our, uh, because of we have way too many uh, things that excite ourselves. Dennis mentioned early on is of anxiety. What is anxiety? And that is basically your muscles are tense. Your body, is, your cells are excited. What makes your cell excited? Calcium is a major one. Calcium is the dominant oxidant intracellularly. Inside the cells, it's the major oxidant or the, 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 the agent that excites, keeps you on, to, on your toes. Magnesium counters that effect, relaxes you. Okay, so I take magnesium, you know, of course, magnesium is another thing. So basically, start, I mean, about blood pressure, changing your diet to at least low carb, okay? And then adding magnesium. And usually we say 500 milligram or 1000 milligram by mouse. Don't worry, by mouse, it's very safe because when you take it, if it's too much, it basically improves your bowel movements. You will poop it out. You're not gonna have an overdose on magnesium. It's very safe. Uh, we, we tend to be low on magnesium. It's very hard to go over this on that. If that's not enough, you can add some long-term acting anti-calcium uh, channel blocker. That is a very, very important. I know we use a lot of for, for other conditions too. So with those, I, I have treated many high blood pressure patients and that's one of the easiest. A lot of people have five, six medications, blood pressure is still unstable. And with these, I haven't, let me put it this way. I yet have to meet one high blood pressure I'm not able to control, okay? I can control so far everyone. Thank you, Dr. Cheng. I actually have a, yeah, I have a little bit of feedback on just what you, are, you have been saying. Uh, I have some friends share with me, they use and suffer to uh, counter their high uh, blood, uh, high glucose. In their, in their age. And we all know that saffron is rich in magnesium. So that's maybe the, one of the very important uh, lessons yeah. we can learn from, from you and uh, as well as uh, other people's stories. Yes, yeah. yeah. That's an excellent point, yes. Thank you, Dr. Chang. There's a one last question, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's from the WeChat group. So the people have been seeing your, your papers published about vitamin C, high dose mm. vitamin C. Yeah. So how much vitamin C do you recommend for daily intake? That's a that's a good excellent question. Okay, that's a very good question. And first of all, let me put it this way: in chemistry or in, in medicine or in biochemistry, there's a term so-called LD50, so-called LISO dose 50. That's Basically, that's, you know, of course, not humans, you know, that's for animals, you know. When they do studies, they use the different doses to see what doses will kill half of the, half of the animals or whatever, right? So that's called LD50. Vitamin C, there is no LD50, meaning we don't know the toxic level. So far, we don't know. That's number one. Number two, uh, uh, the National Cancer Institute, United States, NIH, has a so-called physician desk reference, PDQ. And the PDQ, they basically is, is a consensus report among a group of experts, okay? They publish a PDQ on vitamin C. Again, this is official. People like to official, not just my opinion. And uh, so on this PDQ, the last time they updated it was June. I uh, forgot, uh, two months ago, okay? Actually, it's usually it's the same thing. They just keep on updating so the people use it they know it's the newest, okay? A anyway, the, the message is, this is the message. High dose vitamin C by IV. We're talking about uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical level, okay? Up to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight 
if administered properly on the trained physician, it's generally well tolerated without side effects. What does that mean? That means for somebody 60 kilogram, I'm about 60. Uh, I guess I'm more than 60. <laughs> that's more than 60, yes. Anyway, so for somebody about 60 kilogram, that's 90 grams, 90,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day each time, IV. That's efficient. That, you know, just you know, I've been talking about vitamin C. I became a little bit internationally recognized on this. Actually, next month I'm going to Tokyo to give a, conf a talk on this on the conference. And uh, is I've been telling everybody, uh, well, let's not get me started. I get uh, upset. Is because vitamin C. I was invited to NIH to give a talk on at the early time of COVID-19 about high dose vitamin C killing virus. Lots of research in the literature. And they just don't want to hear about it, okay? And uh, so anyway, so vitamin C to our regular people. Uh, I usually take about 10 grams a day. I advise everybody to take at least uh, three, five grams. There are many different uses of vitamin C. And uh, so on average daily, uh, we, like I said, uh, three, five grams. When I travel, you know, Jesse knows that I, I spent about 10 months in China during a, a pandemic. And then I, I was invited to, to Europe and then from Europe got back to America. And I never caught any problems. You know, I, whenever, whenever I don't have to, I don't, I hate masks. I just don't feel comfortable. Okay. So why, whenever I travel, when I'm exposed to the crowd, travel in the plane or whatever, I take high dose. I mean, I take vitamin C every day, but I do have a protocol basically. Vitamin C, vitamin D, about vitamin D. I recommend at least 5,000 units a day. Yes, 5,000, you don't have even to test the brand. I guarantee you it's safe. I have science to support, not just my statement, okay? So again, just you know, when I say something different, I always face the risk of going to court, going to the court. I'm always prepared. I want to have a chance to debate. Why? Here's the science. Anyway, so vitamin C, vitamin D, those are the basic ones, okay? If you can add, add a few, like, uh, like uh, uh, Helen was talking about, alpha-lipoic acid, CoQ10, magnesium. Basically, for me, I take all of them. I have something called a total cell nutrition, because <laughs> the old, like I have this, you know, I'm a Chinese, so the Chinese medicine's concept of a holistic is, deeply in, inbred in my, in my brain, because you know, I'm really against the single agent concept. I'm not saying that I don't use high dose single agent. For example, I've been using IV vitamin C drip, IV, uh, IV glutathione, I will talk about treating acutely ear disease, uh, you know, COVID-19 patient. I, I've been providing international consultation to COVID-19 patients worldwide. I've, I, I have never lost anybody, you know. And uh, anyway, so yes, that's the answer to uh, to your question, yeah, vitamin C. Thank you, Dr. Chang. So Helen have another question. So I think, Helen, do you mind we answer the question next time? Because right now it's we are 20 minutes to finish. So, so and Dr. Chang, I think, thank you for the Q&A session and it's yeah. really beneficial for everyone yeah. and Helen we promise you will come back um, to the vitamin C all the vitamin C questions in our next lecture series so uh, so right now I want to introduce Helen to everyone so Helen is uh, with New York Life so we want Helen to share about her experience with the anti-aging journey also the work that she does to help people to prepare. Thank you, uh, Edward. Thank you, Jesse, for having me here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen, sharing with us with the holistic view and the in-depth scientific uh, facts on, as well as medical cases from his practice. And um, for me, I'd like to share with all of us some practical aspect about how to manage our aging process and how some people successfully uh, achieved it. And I'm going to talk about some individuals that I recently visited in a senior living facility. It's a kind of a high-end senior living facility in New Jersey. 
I'm happy uh, encounter with them with the, all those very high uh, senior happy residents over there. And I'm surprised to find that very uh, positive surprise find uh, in the US you have for senior people, they have uh, such a good place to spend their um, retirement or assistant living situation. So uh, let me go. Uh, can I have a sharing privilege, Jesse? Uh, yes. Okay. Like to share some slides here. And so with my work experience and my job, I, I encounter a lot of uh, senior people to uh, facilitate the help with them to planning their particular financial aspect, as well as um, I learn a lot from those my client and my the people for prospect. Uh, with as I have biological background, um, particularly about chemistry background, so I'm very um, uh, very into this topic for aging process. Let's um, let's see how the fifty plus people can successfully plan in their future down the road for thirty even fifty years. Let's meet Barbara. Barbara is ninety, happy ninety five years. When I meet him uh, August the 5th this year at the senior living facility in New Jersey. For Barbara, and I'm going to briefly talk her story when we cover some other people as well uh, in their same facility. So, what they managed to do is they have their uh, living, senior living arranged ahead of time successfully and when they need it it's there at the place and they just use it I, and they don't have any worry don't have any extra anxiety to they don't have to even uh, spend the dollar to dollar from their pocket or the accumulation from their whole life so what Barbara was doing is he after the 55 years old and he moved in a uh, senior living and uh, living for a 50 plus a community. And then when he entered into his 80s, he moved into the, from the 50 plus to assisted living in independent sections. That's the one of the facility in New Jersey. In, this facility has um, covers 98 acres. They only have 1500 senior people living there. And among those 1,500 senior people, about 15 of them aged 100 and beyond. So it, we can see that from the fact they have been taken care of very well. It, only uh, 1,500 people, while the on-site on doctors, nurse, and other staff is more than 700. So it's basically a one to two uh, ratio here. They have a lot of activity and entertainment going on. Barbara is one of them. It's approaching to a hundred year old. There is another Barbara. It's in on this picture. She lived in there for more than seventeen years. What she encountered is not only like Barbara's uh, seniors assisted living. Her husband is in the nursing section of this facility now. And there's another lady, it's Patricia, it's a Chinese lady. She is also in assistant living, basically 24 hours in care. What she happened to Patricia is she is in dementia situation. So for those three families, how they successfully manage it, all three of them, they, man they manage to have the long-term care insurance while they are enjoying in their senior time now. So in our company, we provided this kind of insurance, which is cover the majority of the expenses. For Barbara's, the other Barbara's husband, she her expenses, 24 hours expenses, is fully covered by her uh, long-term care insurance. For Barbara living in independent sections, her assistant for home care is covered by long-term care insurance. So given that, we know planning, 
ahead of time when we still able to in our 50s, 60s. That's going to be help tremendously for our senior years down the road when we really need it. No matter how much we do, eventually we'll enter to that stage. We need somebody help. How, are we going to count in on our loved one or families? Do we want to have them bearing the emotion stress, financial stress, and even the, their career stress? Most of the clients answer to us, no, they don't. They only want their family or their loved one be a manager or case manager of their long-term care or their senior living situation. They don't want to do the actually labor work. They want some trained uh, professionals taking care of them on a daily basis while their, their children, their uh, spouse, in the case manager. So avoid uh, kind of relieve a lot of more pressure from the loved ones while they maintain a great relationship and a long lasting, happy uh, senior living life. So this is all, when, when Edward saw, I share with um, Barbara's story, he's very interesting. So he said, why not share with all the audience uh, we're going to have a seminar? Maybe that's going to be something helpful or valuable for the audience too. If that's the case, and everybody will be happy. So if you guys need more information about long-term care, about maybe some facilities in New Jersey, uh, I can be one of the, your point of contact to, to reach that out. And I, if you need uh, my contact information, you can ask Jesse how to reach me. And, or you, you can, you please feel free to reach me through the WeChat group. And we can talk, we can touch base and talk from there and let's figure out what's in your mind, what kind of information you need further. So that's all I can talk today. Any questions? Oh, thank you, Helen, for the information. It's uh, really exciting to see, you know, this elderly, they're living a really good life. So I think that's very uh, empower. I think it's an empowerment from all of the good, you know, from the doctors, from this, from a lot of, you know, the care, care industry and someone like you to provide, you know, to make it happen. So yes, please, the hi audience, do you have any questions for Helen? So maybe we can take one or two questions. Yes, um, I have a, a just like to ask, like a typically from what age do people plan for, uh, for for this care, uh, like uh, college graduates, is that too early or is still uh, feasible? I mean, practical for them to plan, or have to be like fifty or until fifty years old or some something like that. It's a long term care. It's not only for senior people. It's actually for anybody. As long as you are in in the situation, um, in a long time, you need the help. People help you with two of. I didn't show the slides. I'm sure they can. Uh, there are two, if you have the two uh, daily activities, if you need somebody, you cannot do it, it uh, no matter it's injury or disease, and you can, you need somebody help you. And then you are in a long-term situation, long-term care situation, and you can claim it. So th this, this is basically, but most people when they young, if they in injured, they, they, they prefer to recover themselves. They can manage that. If one leg has been uh, injured, they, they still can use aid to manage themselves. They, they won't see the long-term care benefit for later use. When they at the senior year, they don't, they don't have the ability to recover very soon. So because you, if you use it later, you have the accumulation time longer, you will benefit full. For the long-term care, it's going to be grow much, much bigger. So that's why the people, even though they are in your younger year, they have the long-term care situation, they can use this benefit. But uh, most people they prefer to use it at their senior time. They are more when they are more vulnerable from all aspects. 
Okay, okay, thank you. And also, Helen, so if does these long-term care or these facilities, do they provide like anti-aging product? Like some something like uh, Dr. Chen mentioned earlier, like do they have, do they provide these kind of service? Um, not for my knowledge, no. What they were doing, the on-site doctors may give individual different suggestions. Like those doctors and the nurse, they were taking care of the senior people. I did ask Barbara, do you take a dietary supplement, the supplements? She said, yes, she's taking vitamin uh, complex as well as, um, sorry about Dr. Chen, uh, calciums, also vitamin D uh, in addition to regular uh, uh, complex vitamin. So that's, that's her situation. And she, I don't think they are, I'm not sure they, they do have systematic to give all of those uh, senior peoples. It's more like Barbara told me, she bought it from the CVS on, on their campus. So basically it looks like it's not a prescription uh, uh, supplementary. It's more like a generic over the counter regular. She didn't even remember the brand. She wants to show me, she invited me to her house. Um, but I went there, but eventually both her and I forget to look at her supplementaries. <laughs> so, and she asked, invited me to come back again, maybe next time I'll get a list of what she's doing, um, maintain such a good stat for a 95 year old. So the question is, I don't know. Yes, I think it will be interesting next time we can invite, you know, a few these elderly to join us to share their wisdom with us i think it will be oh so interesting okay so uh, thank you for I, sharing helen no problem thank you so i think this is our first lecture thank you everyone for joining so um any questions if everybody have any questions we can uh we have a wechat group that you can ask uh, the questions and then we'll gather the questions for Dr. Chain to answer or for Helen to answer. Also, we'll have a uh, LinkedIn group as well. So we can continue all the anti-aging discussions there. And anyone if uh, have questions for Y Fountain and uh, we can also collect the questions from WeChat group and LinkedIn group. So thank you everyone for joining tonight. And we'll continue this anti-aging series. So we'll invite Dr. Chen back in two weeks. So hopefully we'll see you guys there. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Dr. Thank Chen. you. Oh, Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone.